that. Even with some English, I still couldn't speak their local language. Mm-hmm. So I experienced so many times again and again of this feeling of not having the word to say what I wanted to say. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, when I just let go of the expectation, you know, now like it's impossible for me to say the right thing or say clever things. So I just have to be oh, <laughs> who yeah, I am. Yeah. And, yeah, connect with people in a very simple way. So the moment I just let go of the fixed expectation, everything became so easy. Like I could just connect with people just by doing things together, offering to help or cook food together and just to, you know, express the joy of eating food together oh, uh, physically okay. or mm-hmm. by, you know, um, being interested and in asking simple questions and trying to understand or so this time of traveling and being the you know poor backpacking woman <laughs> really helped me to open up and be okay not to be the perfect person or the person who is articulate you know but then by letting that go i could communicate with people 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 same business different day Good afternoon and welcome back to the Same Business, Different Day podcast. Uh, my name is Zeke Corley. I'm here with uh, my favorite co-host, favorite. my favorite podcast co-host <laughs> in the world, Alyssa Lee Good. How are you doing? I'm doing really great, Zeke. Good, good. I also want to shout out uh, Star Fox Media and Nash back there controlling the boards. Mm-hmm. We really appreciate you. Um, you know, we were approached by today's guest back in March. Uh, of this year Uh, when we were told that she had been listening to our podcast from literally the other side of the world we were flattered one of the shows they listed was episode six our interview with david zumaya about bringing communities together this inspired them to reach out to us and ask if they could be on our show we learned more about what she was doing and we're sure that she fits 100 percent into our model for a perfect guest for this show. We'd like the same business different day audience to give a warm welcome they can hear from Vista, California to Singapore. Thank you for being with us, Masami Soto. Hi, Masami. (laughs) Hi, um, it's great to be here. So thank you so much for having me and having us. (laughs) We're really glad to have you. Now we have some rules to this game. Alyssa's gonna tell you a little bit. All right. So we really only have one rule. We say rules, but it's just the one. um, It's just the outline of our podcast. So at first, uh, we want to talk about your upbringing, where you came from and the importance Mm -hmm. behind that before we talk about where you got today and the the, the decisions that led there. Um, So we will reveal at a certain point your professional point of life. But before that, let's just sit back and hear about you know, how you got to where you are. <laughs> mm, um, before I get started, can I ask you a question sure. about that question? Okay. <laughs> yeah. I like asking questions. Okay. Um, <laughs> so why do you actually first ask um, about the childhood of the person being featured? Is it because you always find that there's a very strong link between the childhood story and what that person end up doing in life? <laughs> yes and no. Um, every time we ask we get a different story and sometimes Mm. it's an immediate connection. Um, But Mm. oftentimes I'm going to say more often than not, it's completely separate that the childhood upbringing has nothing to do with what someone currently does. And I think that's the main reason we asked the question because Mm. it's just the story of no matter where you came from, you can be Mm. successful in what your Mm. dream and what your desires are. So, Mm. you know, we want to hear (laughs) past influences just to see, you know, where someone came from and how it correlates to what they are now. (laughs) Great. Thank you for explaining that. But um, anyway, uh, let me, you know, explain mine, because um, for me, like looking back and how I was growing up in Japan, I probably would have never thought that one day in my future, I will be speaking on a thing called a podcast Uh to a global (laughs) audience. (laughs) I would have never thought that. Um, So um, the reason why was I was from, um, I was born in Tokyo. 
And I grew up um, in Tokyo and the surrounding area. Um, but when I was growing up, um, for me, like it was not so common to see people from overseas. Like you know, Japanese communities are pretty much closed, and I was very, very shy child. So I was always scared of talking in front of people, even in front of like my friend uh, at school. So I was usually the quietest child, very shy, um, scared of strangers. So um, when I was growing up um, being in uh, my grandparents' uh, space because they used to have this tiny business in Tokyo. So um, even though I was very shy, I loved helping my grandparents out, you know, in their business. So I used to uh, sweep the, you know, shop front and stock up the shelves or uh, serve the customers. Um, but one day, you know, if any foreigners walk in, because it was in Tokyo, so still there were some foreigners sure, <laughs> living sure. or working there. Uh-huh at that time so if that ever happened i would be so scared and i would run back you know to the back of the shop Uh, and uh, screaming like uh, gaijin gaijin and this word gaijin in japanese means um, foreigner but also it uh, literally meant outsiders so when we see foreigners then for us they were outsiders you know some people like coming from a uh, foreign unknown place and they looked different spoke a different language so to me like the world outside was very scary like in a, in a sense because we couldn't understand wow. them yeah. so anyway um growing up in my grandparents' business. I loved uh, learning so much from business, you know, running small business and uh, really learning the concept of service and the spirit of business or um, taking care of family business together. And it was more than, you know, getting a job and getting paid, right? Like, because you are part of the family. So everybody takes care of their own responsibilities, not because they get paid, but this is what our family was about. So um, anyway, then when I grew up and uh, graduated from school, one day I decided to um, actually leave Japan and travel around the world. And that wasn't necessarily because I was like already very interested in connecting with people outside, but I, I just was curious. You know, I knew that there was a bigger world outside and that I couldn't understand. So although it was scary too, but I decided to travel and I became this young female backpacker traveling alone uh, to many different parts of the world, you know, with limited money as well, amount of money as well. Mm-hmm. But, but you broke you broke that uh, that social nervousness though at some point right that that sounds like what happened right because at some point but before it was gaijin gaijin but now (laughs) but now you're like okay let's go meet people let's go to other places where they're everybody's an outsider heck you're an outsider right going to these other places and traveling so how did you actually break that (laughs) that nervousness Actually, I didn't break it until that time. But what what happened to me um, was because in my childhood, like I was always asking questions, you know, inside of me, but didn't ask people, but I was asking myself and trying to always figure out the answers to my own questions. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions I had was probably, you know, why we all existed. Right. Like, why, why is this all happening? And um, also because uh, my parents, you know, they're in their generation, uh, they had this very strong belief that they had to work really hard to um, create a good life for their own family. So um, my father coming from uh, rural Japan and he was uh, less educated. Um, he really struggled in the Japanese society, like in the corporate world. So he got a job, but then, you know, he had to work extra hard to try to advance in his own career compared to people who had the college degree. So okay. um, we, in that and family initially struggling, uh, you know, being a quite low income family in the middle class. And so my parents working really hard, but at home, they weren't really happy because my you know father wouldn't to spend any time at home he comes home very very late at night and you know he may be under stress and quite angry at home or so growing up in that way as a quite insecure child i thought like why are we doing all this like we are not happy and uh 
what about you know having more and more things like is it so important or so then i started to have so much question and so much question about how the world was all working out i yeah. couldn't help but wanting to go and see yeah. <laughs> you yes. know um yeah. so there was so much unknown in the world so initially it didn't come across to me like this was an opportunity to connect with people okay. but i just went there to try to answer my own question and but what happened was really amazing because when i went out of japan and lost my words because you know in japan i was shy and quiet but i could speak japanese Mm -hmm. So if I needed to say something, I could still say it. Sure. But when I left Japan, I actually lost my words because, you know, <laughs> I first nice couldn't place. speak yeah. English <laughs> when yeah. I left. <laughs> and second, even if I, after I learned English in, you know, first in Canada and I traveled to other parts of the world, but whenever I went to another new country, then you know, even with some English, I still couldn't speak their local language. Mm -hmm. So I experienced so many times again and again of this feeling of not having the word to say what I wanted to say. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, when I just let go of the expectation, you know, now like it's impossible for me to say the right thing or say clever things. So I just have to be yeah, <laughs> who yeah, I am. Yeah. And yeah, connect with people in a very simple way. So the moment I just let go of that fixed expectation, everything became so easy. Like I could just connect with people just by doing things together, offering to help or cook food together and just to you know, express the joy of eating food together oh, uh, physically okay. or mm -hmm. by you know um, being interested and asking simple questions and trying to understand or so this time of traveling and being the you know poor backpacking woman <laughs> really helped me to open up and be okay not to be the perfect person or the person who is articulate you know but then by letting that go i could communicate with people um, in a new wow. way i love so. it you know i i mean you know one you could say food is one way of, of communication Absolutely. you know right yeah. that's that's a language within itself no yeah. matter where you go. But what we also talk about a lot on this podcast is networking, right? Mm -hmm. We talk about being able to socialize with others because at some point when you find things in common, then you can help each other. And it sounds yeah. like that that's kind of, you know, what you were learning out there is figuring out how to communicate with, with others, even if you didn't speak the same language and, mm -hmm. you know, you, you were building relationships from that. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. So that was an interesting time of my youth. Um, but then there's just one another interesting thing, because when I um, started to really enjoy traveling and connecting with people, and uh, I loved that, you know, simple moment of sharing things together. But there's another thing then uh, that back then that came up for me that I didn't know why. Uh, those things were happening. So uh, it was this that um, in some countries I traveled, there were people who had a quite good life. You know, sure. they had an old nice house, nice yeah. car, nice children. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, but then there were some people who didn't seem to ha be happy or fulfilled um, and, uh, you know, really under stress. Or So I saw that um, in the part of the world. And then um, when I went to places where uh, there were very limited resources, um, quite often I met with people who were so um, poor in a material way, but at the same time, very, very happy and generous. So uh, often people invited me and come and eat at their homes and share the food with their children. Or, and but then because I could see like from my point of view that they had so little, you know, they probably didn't know um, whether they could keep feeding their children you know next day or um so but they were very generous and happily sharing what they had so i used to think like you know you can't share what you have with me because you have so little um and so i didn't know like why like there are parts of the world where you know even young children can't even complete primary school education because they had to work in the field or go and then beg on the street or you know people with physical disability uh who is sleeping on the street or so um so i thought like you know this was all strange because people who had a lot may not be happy 
But then there are lots of problems in the world where people may not even have a very, very basic resources. And um, I really question this. And at one point, I thought like, oh, maybe the consumerism is the source of like those problems mm -hmm. um, and driving us to do these things or uh, create the social issues or so. Um, uh, you know, I, I didn't know how to solve this, but at one point I decided that, well, actually, if consumerism is not that such a good thing, then maybe I should disconnect from that. And then uh, I decided to let go of things. And then um, when I got back in Japan, I moved to a country to countryside and lived with farmers and trying to learn from them about how to become self-sufficient and you know make own food build own homes uh wow. make own clothes or wow. you know, wow. all that yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> the san diego craft beer industry has proven to be incredibly resilient regardless of tier they're following all guidelines to ensure the safety of their loyal customers and staff they want you to feel safe coming out enjoying a beer or picking it up to go Breweries are open and welcoming guests into a sense of normalcy through a great craft brew. While resilient, the beer industry isn't immune to the effects of service limitations and decreased foot traffic. They need your help to stay open and continue serving the craft beer they're famous for. If you're looking for ways to support your favorite local brewery, stop in for a beer, grab some merch, or take some home to share or enjoy later. Cheers. You need insurance, and you need yourinsuranceplace.com as your brokers. And I'll tell you why. They have access to hundreds of carriers and were never left without results. Not even the hard to place risks. A good insurance broker is a problem solver. Our team is dedicated to getting you covered. Take time to shop with yourinsuranceplace.com. Save money, get protected. Yourinsuranceplace.com. The Film Hub is the future of co-working right in downtown Vista. Get energized to go to a safe work environment that is clean and sanitized. Create video content, live stream events, and all of your marketing material in our audio and video facility. Come and visit us at thefilmhubinc.com. Yeah. Um, but anyway, ju just to, to add to that, what happened was after two years of doing that, um, in the end, what I discovered was that actually I was wrong to judge the world, you know, to say, oh, consumerism is a bad thing. Businesses are creating, you know, uh, issues in the world. So I should disconnect from that. You know, that thinking wasn't the right thinking um, mm. in the end for me, because um, I realized how, um, no matter how hard, I tried to become self-sufficient, there was no such thing because we were all connected still. And um, there were lots of things I enjoyed in uh, my life, even in that simple lifestyle back there. But we still, you know, I still um, had to buy, you know, things or tools to grow food or uh, we drove a car to visit the different neighbors. Or So if I judged th those things were wrong, I was denying the simple joy of human existence, mm. of wanting to experience things together, help each other, share things, you know, with each other or enjoy enjoy the moments in life. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So then, you know, I let that go of, uh, let go of the judgment that, and then yeah. that kind of led to the next part. <laughs> the next part. Yes. Now, now but you spent a little time in the food industry. I understand. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, did what, what were you doing, uh, in, in the industry where you, did you open up a shop yeah. or, okay. Can you tell <laughs> us a little bit about that? Cause we want to uh, take that step before we take the next. Mm. So the food for me was a uh, mean to communicate with people right. because when I was, you know, not good at speaking and communicating yes. in words, then food was one way for me to do that. So um, I was passionate about food and always like when I was traveling, got involved in like food related things. Um, so after I left the you know farm life, that because the farm was also related to food, I wanted to learn to grow my own food. But then after that, um, then I started to travel again. Then eventually, uh, one day, I found myself becoming a mom, you know, kind of almost by accident. Okay. <laughs> so when I became a mom for the first time, and back then I was living in New Zealand, um, I looked at my own daughter in my arm and really, really thought about my life because, you know, when you become a parent, then you you 
often experience something you never have experienced before, which is this like a profound sense of love and connection and the, the desire to do anything you can to protect your own child. So when I felt that, then suddenly at that point of time, I started to think about all the other kids I met when I was backpacking. You know, kids who didn't go to school, uh, kids who were begging on the street. And then I thought like, maybe like my daughter could have been any one of them. Sure. She was just like, she happened to be born as my child. But if I wanted to do so much for my own child, then what happened to those kids who didn't have parents? Or So um, that was the time I decided to do something about it. You know, I didn't know why, but then because... Um, when I decided to start a business, because of my background and my love and passion for food, I simply chose a food business to go into. And then the um, mission or the goal uh, of the business was to um, create a great business that benefits our customers so that we could actually give the profits to help um, uh, feed and educate uh, kids in the world. Mm. So that was how I got into food business. <laughs> um, tell me a little bit about your experience with education. Um, what kind of schooling did you see yourself through? Mm, actually, like I just, you know, go, went through all the normal, like the very uh, conventional Japanese school education uh, system. So I didn't go to any like a special private school or anything. Mm -hmm. I went to where all the kids in the neighborhood went in my like area. But um, one thing that was a little different from what other kids experienced um, was because uh, that I moved, you know, from school to school because my father worked for a large, um, one of the largest food company in Japan. So with that, he was quite often moved to different branches in Japan. And so when that happened, then the family would follow him uh, even during the school semester so suddenly like this very shy child is pulled out from school and placed in the brand new school wow. mm -hmm. where I didn't know anybody oh my gosh. So, so that just like your travels <laughs> yes yes yeah. but that was traumatic and yeah. it was in Japanese uh, place so I did you know sometimes yeah, that bullied or yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so yeah so that was probably one thing that's memorable for me wow. <laughs> about the school education Oh, wow. That'd be so difficult as a shy child, just constantly moving around. <laughs> I moved to a few different yeah. schools and, and that was difficult. And, it, you know, it was always like a different mm. environment every time we moved. Mm. Um, but, you know, it, it's trying. But at the same time, though, it gives you a lot of experience. You know, you, you got to learn to, you know, not necessarily fit in, but learn how to get along with others. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Learn who people are. And, um, you know, you don't want to necessarily put them in categories, but you do see the the trends of people socially okay. from school to school. Um, mm. Yeah, that that's that's a it's a it's a tough upbringing, but it did teach you a lot because it seems like you kind of carried that along in uh, in your travels. Like I said, because when you got out to those other places like, hey, you know, strangers. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I've been around strangers before, so I can, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. let's get to the reveal. Mm -hmm. You think? I think we're ready. OK, um, you heard Masami talk about consumerism. Um, we are a world of consumers, uh, but we're also a world of building and creating. But ideally, we can also be a world of giving. Today, we are talking to a visionary who is making an impact in the world of giving, helping us all give back one purchase at a time. The founder and owner of B1G1, Buy One, Give One, Masami Soto, thanks so much again for being with us today. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here <laughs> as well, so thank you. Thank you. Can you give us, uh, just, just break down the mission for us. Tell us the mission of B1G1, please. Mm. So the mission of B1J1 is very simple. We are here to create a world that's full of giving. And when we say the world full of giving, there are two parts to it. The one is that um, we see that if, you know, businesses in the world that are doing so many things every day, um, if they could embed effective giving in what they are doing, then of course, without, you know, doing a big campaign or anything, the world would be full of 
impactful giving. But another part of it is the spirit of giving that we don't necessarily do what we do to only transfer the you know, amount of funds from businesses to uh, great causes in the world. That's just a part of what we do. Another thing is that we want to help businesses create this great spirit of giving in what they are doing so that they can create a sense of connections uh, with the people they are working with. Mm. Mm. Um, I'd like to know the roots of where this idea came from. How did this start? <laughs> so it's uh, originated back in the business I had before B1G1, mm-hmm. and that was a food business. And the reason why it was a food business was because I personally loved food, and food was kind of my way to connect with people um, and to really learn about the world as well, because, you know, food comes from so many different p- parts of the world in different ways. So I got into food business with the mission to give back. Um, But my idea was that when our business created lots of profit, then I wanted to help build a soup kitchen so that, you know, we can help street children uh, and, uh, you know, feed them and help educate them. So that was kind of like my original idea with the food business. And so I became an entrepreneur 20 years ago with a young baby on my back and working hard and building a business for like over five or six years period. So what happened was initially starting as a very humble industrial takeaway food bar. You know? <laughs> and then I sold, like I bought and sold a couple of businesses and started a new concept of business, which was about giving healthy eating options for busy working people. So we had a frozen packaged meat that we distributed through supermarkets or um, retail stores in Australia. Um, And then uh, at one point of time, we had about like 150 stores selling up uh, food products. And so, but then that was the point of time I paused one day and then thought like, well, actually our business is gradually growing, but we weren't doing anything because we were putting, you know, working hard to put all the resources back into business to grow the sure. business. Right. And always feeling like we are not yeah. ready, we are not enough. You yes. Know? Yes. Um, so one day this simple idea came to us, like, uh, and we thought, you know, what if um, we just did one thing every time we sold our product or every time, you know, our team was doing something. And so the idea of B1J1 came to me that time. And we implemented the concept in our business initially in such a way that every meal we sold, we will help feed a child. And we did so through an NGO in India, you know, which is experienced in midday meal program to encourage kids to come to school to get free meal. So, but then uh, several months later, uh, there was another realization moment for me that um, actually I was very happy to be doing that in my business, but then I also knew so many other amazing business people, you know, I was connected with and they were caring and they were passionate uh, in their own way about something. And so I thought, what if um, we could make this way of embedding the giving easy for any business to do, but the, so that they can create the impact in the way they care about. Um, So then I eventually sold my food company and then moved to Singapore to start the B1G1, um, known as also Buy One Give One, uh, to be the global giving initiative. Um, And that was uh, 2007, so it's nearly 14 years since. (laughs) All right. (laughs) That's amazing. It is. Um, Giving back, I mean, to do that worldwide, I mean, that's a major undertaking. I mean, how do you pull something like that off where, you know, you're, you're talking about a global initiative. We're not just talking mm-hmm. about helping the kids on the street or, uh, mm-hmm. you know, in your area or, you know, uh, underprivileged folks in, you know, your country or other countries next to you. We're talking mm-hmm. about globally. And, and how how do you do something like that? Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> well, actually, when we started, we didn't know how. Um, Mm -hmm. But we were very compelled by this idea of, you know, the world full of giving, because we really believed that's the way to 
really influence the ecosystem of the world, you know, rather than just fighting one program after the other, because we already had world full of businesses and world full of human spirit and the care that those business people had you know when they first started their business i believe that they all had a very strong sense of passion or purpose in some way because otherwise who would start a business it's a <laughs> tough thing to do right. so yeah. we just wanted to be the one to be able to connect these dots together and to do so in a global way because you know the global community and the ecosystem is all connected we are living in this like part of the web of the world mm -hmm. so if we are to do that then we thought where would we be to do this and somehow back then we chose singapore and i think it's a you know good choice and sometimes it, you know we thought like it was a limited decision we made or but you know looking back i think we were exactly in the right place at the right time um and you know look at what we are doing now that we are in Singapore and you are in America and we are talking like this you know, live yeah. <laughs> yeah. and so um, I think uh, we didn't know all of how to make this work um, but what we knew was that kind of feeling that it was the right thing and then after that it was really about doing things or connecting with people and learning from them like people with certain experience and learning from them about what would work better so um that's why like you know after a decade we are not like overnight success or a huge very famous initiative in the world just yet but we believe that all the things we've done in that last decade has actually contributed to where we are at today so we are still making this happen one step at a time day by day love it i love yeah. it welcome back everybody historic downtown vista is open and waiting for you Six award-winning breweries, more than 40 restaurants, theaters, art, music, and fun shops from home decor and clothing to gems and even exotic birds and fish. The hometown charm that makes Downtown Vista so special is swinging its doors open to say hello. Visit downtownvista.org to learn more. That's downtownvista.org. We look forward to seeing you soon. Ready to build exposure for your Vista business? Join the Vista is Open campaign, a free service that promotes Vista's creative and innovative businesses throughout the North County region. Add your company's special events to our calendar viewed by thousands each month. Get listed in our shopping and brewery directories. We'll also share your business story through regional and social media outlets, all at no cost to you. Visit vistaisopen.com to learn more. That's vistaisopen.com. You know, when mm. you have uh, businesses um, that, are, like you talk about the food industry, right? You know, mm. so mm. many uh, people in the food industry or businesses in the food industry have such slim margins. Now, how do you talk to them and convince them that, hey, even mm. though you're a small business and, and, you know, you don't have much to work with, how do they find something to work with to, so that they can work with you and they can give back the way that, you know, that you believe? Mm. So in the early days of B1G1, this was very, very challenging for us to do because there was really nobody looking out for ways to give, yeah. <laughs> you know, especially small to medium sized businesses. They sure. were busy like learning how to about how to grow business 100%. rather than how to give the hard earned yeah. money. So, yeah. so what we had to do back then was actually to go and meet with people and you know, whether appearing at a business event and then suddenly introducing this thought and a new potential and idea, then we still had, you know, out of the room full of business people, there are some people who said, oh, I love that idea of world full of giving. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I want my company to be part of it. Yeah. So with that, you know, face-to-face -face connection, interaction, communicating, uh, we could still, you know, find the, the initial partners of this initiative back then. Mm -hmm. Then what happened was uh, over the years, we started to realize that this traveling around the world model, like the circus, <laughs> they didn't, you know, wasn't as scalable. So yeah, we then started to realize the potential of online media. And we tried to communicate that through online channels, you know, the best we could. But it's, of course, much harder to do so because the attention span in the online engagement is very short. And um, so we kind of 
you know, had a struggling time at that time, but um, the time started to change around us. You know, there is more and more awareness about the business, either social responsibility or how businesses or individuals can also and should contribute toward the global goals. Or So more um, people are actually starting to actively seek out this information too. So today, B1G1, you know, without doing any international travel for more than a year, okay. <laughs> we have actually at first survived uh, the most difficult time. And then after that, this uh, movement in the community started to thrive from like later last year, um, everything started to bounce back. And in the first part of this year, 2021, we had record number of businesses joining us and the record um, amount of giving and record numbers of giving impacts being created. So um, yeah, so somehow like, <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, can you give us an example of a business you've worked with? You don't have to tell us which one or anything, but um, mm -hmm. that you've worked with and how they've given back to any community. Mm -hmm. You know, what, give us an example of what exactly it is that mm -hmm. you do. Good question. Mm. Okay, so since you are in America, let me talk about two examples of, uh, you know, uh, US-based business and also a cause, even though this is global. So, sure. you know, many businesses are everywhere around the world. So as the project and what it causes that we work with. So the uh, example of America is um, this uh, uh, one business I really love, um, though I love all the businesses. <laughs> but one business I really love, it's called um, Okakuatics, and which is a swim school in Miami. Okay. And they have a multiple um, swim schools. So um, the owner of this business is very, 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 very passionate about human development. So um, she is focused always on growing leaders through this business. So swim school is her passion, but then growing people is the actual biggest passion that she has. So she might employ uh, you know, people who come to her without being able to speak English at first, or then she really really develop the leadership potential in people so that the business actually run and grow and inspire kids to come to the same lessons as well. So the company was already inspiring, but when they discovered us, they loved the model of B1J1 of how small things can make a huge impact. So for example, every swim lesson that they have, they would do a particular giving and they, their main giving is to provide access to life-saving water to people around the world. So oh. that's pretty much for focus on that as a company giving, but they also do very lovely things about the birthdays of all of the team members. So every time the team member have a birthday, then they are given a giving credit or budget so that they can decide where the money goes. So some team members may be more passionate about the environment and they want to plant trees with that budget, or some may be more about education or, you know, actually want to help a woman start a business or so every team member can experience their sense of giving mm -hmm. in what they do. But also because the company stands strongly with that giving spirit, it does inspire, you know, the parents to bring the kids and kids have so much fun. And um, so that's one company. And another thing uh, about b one one is that this is a community of businesses, but also community of causes. Um, so the cause part, um, today we see more and more amazing, like, uh, you know, charity organizations, but have a really good enterprising mindset and innovative approach. So one such example is um, US-based charity called Rescuing the Leftover Meat. Uh, leftover cuisine, actually. <clears throat> so what they do is to mobilize young volunteers who want to do something, but they may not have money to donate. Those people volunteer their time and uh, equipped with an application, they will go and pick up leftover food from restaurants or you know cafes or hotels, and then they will deliver those leftover food to homeless shelters. So one that prevents the food being wasted, which reduces carbon um, emission 
you know, because the food left over in landfill will emit uh, carbon. And then another part is that the homeless shelter have resources that they could use to, you know, support the homeless. And, you know, ultimately, like if uh, more people come to have those meals, nourishing meals, and receive certain training or counseling, then uh, the long-term aim is to lift people up to the next level so everybody can become contributors. So, that's kind of two examples, but okay. there are so many other ones. I'd love to keep talking about, which <laughs> we can. Thank you for sharing this, too. I, I was just curious, you know, there's a lot of information on your website about what B1G1 is. And, you know, mm. I'm just researching into, a, you know, I'm curious, you know, do I know of organizations that you work with? And can I go support these businesses? So, <laughs> you know, I want to mm. look more into um, it. Yeah, so what I mentioned to you earlier that, you know, B1G1 is not an overnight success. Now, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a decade painful, you know, growth and we are here today. And um, so in B1G1 today, if you, um, uh, you may actually hear that, oh, actually our local cafe is B1G1 or that accountants, you know, in my town is B1G1. Mm -hmm. So more and more, you know, businesses are coming to us. And today we have, uh, uh, I think, around 3,000 businesses working uh, with us from more than 40 or 45 countries. Um, so you may actually come across B1J1 businesses, but up until now, most of the businesses we work with are small to medium-sized businesses. We kind of almost avoided the large corporations because small to medium-sized businesses are our passion of like connecting the little dots to empower them so that they can collectively create a great impact. But what we are now starting to do after having this like a baseline being created that we have an ecosystem of all these tiny businesses and uh, also the projects around the world so now we have the strength to have invite the larger businesses to join us as well so um, from this you know time on moving forward we are starting to work with you know uh, some of the larger businesses too, um, that the, but the, the businesses that resonate with this mission rather than, you know, trying to provide a CSR service, conventional CSR service to them, we are looking out for larger companies that get inspired by this mission of creating a world full of giving together, not competitively, but together. And then to um, when we have a larger businesses, then perhaps like more people in the world will be able to support B1G1 businesses easier. Okay. <laughs> Great. You got a vision. You got, you know what I also noticed is that uh, you're very eloquent. You, you are a great speaker. And I, I saw your, your TED talk. I saw, uh, um, <laughs> I, I've seen you on YouTube. I've seen you uh, get standing ovations mm -hmm. after addressing people. So <laughs> let's not be modest. We, we, um, we know that you're a great public speaker. I'm interested to know, you know, what drove you into that and, and who it is out there that, you, that, you know, you're speaking to, because you're not just speaking to potential clients, it sounds to mm -hmm. me that you are really speaking to people about the initiative, about giving back. Um, mm -hmm. So where, mm -hmm. where did, how, you know, how, where'd you gain all this confidence to, uh, to do all this public speaking and, and how's that experience been? <laughs> yeah. So, um, because I, you know, before I mentioned to you a little bit about my childhood and, you know, how shy I was. So actually speaking in front of a group of people was very, very difficult, like probably the hardest thing uh, that I would do like in as a younger me. So the reason why I became very comfortable to be talking in front of people today um, is just to, the, you know, fact that I realized that it wasn't actually about me. Right. So when I'm speaking... Uh, it's not about me and it's not about whether I'm right or wrong. It's about actually connecting. And when we understand that actually we are all the same, I mean, every person, um, uh, even though they look different or they speak a different language or they might have a different belief, but if we just understand that we are actually the same or we could be the same um, we, in some way, then suddenly the potential opens up because if I'm not coming from judging anybody and yes. always being just open and yeah. okay to have a different 
different ideas or opinions, but to just to have a fundamental sense of trust and love, then nothing is actually scary. <laughs> so, it. yeah. So then um, when I stood on stage one day and then initially I woke up on, uh, on the stage or in front of people to try to say something and I got this like a panic attack okay. yeah, sure. and I, I, I started to shake and I couldn't say anything. And at that moment, when I just took a breath and then thought like, well, actually this is not a, for me, this is for everybody. And then just let that go. And I said, okay, if I mess it up and say wrong thing, that's not the end of the world because I just love these people here. I love it. Then it worked out. You know, <laughs> so you, now, <laughs> you know, what's next for somebody who, who like you, who has taken all the steps that you had and has the vision that you have. I mean, you know, so when, when do you get into politics? Oh, <laughs> politics is actually politics is actually not really necessarily my thing. But I think what's uh, probably interesting in the world, in times like in this time of the world, and what's happening in the world yes. is um, if because it, you know the politics uh, uh, is very interesting to observe from outside. And for example, in Singapore, I think there are lots of things that's done in. Uh, like a quite impressive way and how this like tiny nation which is island nation mm -hmm. which didn't have own resources and it had very severe scarcity issue of how to get own water and own food and so that insecure nation transformed into a nation of some unique value proposition in the world yeah. and um, Singapore is a thriving country and uh, it's a very interesting country where like people are uh, you know, living here have all different uh, family her heritage like Chinese background, Indian background, Malay background and international community and it's all work together and uh, the way politics drives this nation in the business mindset with the business mindset is very very interesting to see so I think like uh, I'm more like uh, interested in this Business, but I feel that whether it's about the business or running a charity or running the life or running the community or a country, I think if we have this like enterprising mindset and combine that with a charitable and philanthropic mindset together, you know, how we care about people, really understand the problem. And then to create a financial mechanism and, you know, resource mechanism to make what we do more effective, then I think we can create a uh, better world together. <laughs> Sounds like a great politician yeah, is what that's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Zeke Corley, host of the Same Business Different Day podcast. And those of you that listen to the Same Business Different Day podcast know that I love cycling and I have for years. Some of you may remember a recent TV commercial with Major Taylor, a cyclist from the late 1800s that was the second black athlete to win a world championship in any sport. I'm happy to announce that the Major Taylor Cycling Club San Diego is hosting the Juneteenth Bicycle Ride for Unity and Diversity in San Diego on June 19, 2021. Find more information on the San Diego Cyclist page on Facebook. Introducing the Ramona Summer of Wine Trail. Experience the beautiful Ramona wine country, beautiful vineyards, sweeping valleys, sunshine, and wine. Visit up to 16 wineries in the month of June on Saturdays and Sundays. You can purchase a passport for the wine trail for $10, have access to participating wineries, and receive three tastes for $3. Show the wineries your Eventbrite ticket or print out the passport emailed to you the week of the event. The $10 passport is good for all Saturdays and Sundays in June. Check it out on Instagram at Ramona Valley Vineyards and send any questions to marketing at rvva.org. North County Daily Star is the leading source for news and community information. There are 650,000 residents along the 78 corridor in five unique cities that share the region, North County, San Diego. We work and play in these cities, so we are all interested in what happens in our common region. There is no cost to subscribe, and it is continuously updated. So look for us on your mobile device or computer at ncdailystar.com. Um, I want to go to my book corner. Let's go to the book corner. Uh, I'm an avid reader. I love book recommendations. Um, I believe I read that you have your own book. 
Mm. Is that right? Yeah, um, sure. Yes. So if you could tell us a bit about that and then any other mm. recommendations that you might have for us. Mm. Okay, so the uh, one of the books I uh, would recommend is a book called Giving Business. So this is a book I wrote about the whole concept of giving. And I write a bit about B101's origin and everything and personal stories too. But the idea is really the power of giving spirit in business development and the leadership development. Um, so, you know, it talks about a lot of things in a very, very simplistic concept. So it's not necessarily a complex world of CSR uh, effective giving, but it's more about really the effective giving in personal and also business leadership ways. So that's giving business. Another book um, uh, I really loved um, is a book called The Power of Habit. And um, in the work of B1G12, we always talk about the impact, the habit, and connection, because these are the three elements that powers this entire work that we are doing. And the habit is very central to this, but it's the hardest thing to create in our life or in our business. So the Power of Habit book was a really interesting introduction to how we are all driven by this habit that we feel that we are not like in control of, but it actually gives us the steps uh, to actually change our habit too. So if anybody's looking out for interesting books to read, then those are the two books you can. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we love it. We took notes on that. But yeah. Yeah, Alyssa's going to have to read those. <laughs> I, I'm interested to know, I, I speak one and a half languages, Masami. Now, I, after all of the traveling that you've done, how many languages do you speak now? Uh, I would say 2.2. <laughs> so, so two is English and Japanese. Okay. Um, yeah, but then the 0 0.2 is Spanish because I, I did uh, actually study Spanish um, in Guatemala um, when I was traveling. So I spent some time there learning Spanish. We're going to have to have but you I back need again. More practice. We're going to have to have <laughs> you back again. We want to talk more about all the places that you've yeah. been. Well, you know, one of the things um, that, you know, we, we tend to talk about recently on this podcast, which it's hard to avoid talking about, right, is uh, the COVID effect. Ha ha has uh, COVID uh, been a, a good thing, a bad, a, a, like for, for uh, your mm. business and, and mm. the, you know, the way that you looking at uh, your, or your outlook towards uh, your approach w around the world? Um, mm -hmm. How have you been able to work within it and how has it affected you and your business? Mm. I think the you know, fact that this, like what our work is about creating the ecosystem, strong ecosystem, uh, helped us a lot during COVID um, crisis as well, because in, uh, you know, uh, first instance, like when uh, everything went in lockdown, then, uh, you know, we couldn't come to the office to work anymore. So there were lots of challenges. And of course, like many of the businesses that we were working with, you know, small uh, businesses, medium sized businesses were affected by COVID. Some had to shut down or some had to scale down yes. and stop doing their giving for that moment. Or, yeah. So everything dropped at first, but then I told you that it started to come back up. Yeah. And the reason why this come, comeback uh, effect is happening is that certain businesses actually started to innovate much faster during the COVID crisis and they changed their business model or um, you know they found another key advantage or so some businesses started to actually get even stronger you know beyond the COVID crisis and they started to give more actively or more businesses started to uh, uh, join us and some of them are new businesses um, because you know this crisis actually showed us the importance of us taking action as well. So um, as a community of small businesses, the overall effect is that, of course, like there are certain you know, things that happen and things go down, but other parts could get stronger. And uh, together as a movement in the community, we become stronger. But if we had an initiative, which is to serve like a few handful of massive mega corporations, and they said to us like, oh, we can't continue anymore, then we could have been, you know, shut down at that time. So um, that's why, like, I think this uh, uh, situation, like crisis gave us a lot of uh, um, learning. And also the causes that we work with are all being affected big time as well. But there is more and more desire for businesses to support these uh, people who are in greater need and challenges. So it's mm -hmm. very inspiring to see um, what collective businesses could do. I love it. Yeah, that's great. 
Yeah, I love it. <laughs> um, you know, one thing I want to ask you, just for a favor, if if you could give, uh, I, you know, we t- we told you early on um, or, or before we started the show what, uh, you know, our show was really about and who our audience is. And mm-hmm. uh, a lot of these folks are aspiring to be business owners. Some are already business owners. Some are trying to think about whether or not to take a left or a right turn in their business. And some just want to hear good stories. But if you have any advice uh, to give mm-hmm. to our listeners, you know, just, a, you know, a word either of encouragement or, or just, uh, mm-hmm. you know, something that you can say about your path that that helped you that might help them. I, I think that, mm-hmm. uh, you know, we'd appreciate a good a, a good word from you. Mm-hmm. OK, so um, one thing that's applicable for every one, um, I think, is the power of giving focus. So. Um, I learned in my childhood that it was about getting something, you know, like we had to work hard to get more money to buy more stuff or have to have a bigger house or yeah. uh, to be more, you know, famous. Or So sure. we had this, like, I, I had this, like, you know, understanding that we, I had to be a go-getter. So that was the idea. Mm. But what happened was I then, you know, throughout my life after that, realized that actually that approach was very hard. And, and so when we shift that the getting mindset into giving mindset, everything becomes so much easier. Um, so what happened is if, for example, we want to have love, you know, experience more love, is it easier to uh, have a love by trying to get the love or trying <laughs> to be loved? Or is it easier to just be loving Mm. You know, <laughs> and then, uh, same as attention we want to have. or um, So actually, when we shift the mindset into the giving focus, then we start from the recognition of something that we already have. You know, oh, I already can love people. I already have a time that I can use to help people. Or then we start utilizing what we have. And then as a result, what we end up happening is that we actually receive the yes. things we want. And so that focus is an easier way to have everything we want. But at the same time, it's the way where fundamentally on the day to day, we can have a more joy and a sense of meaning and purpose. So that's uh, one advice to everybody to shift to that. And then uh, one, another thing is if you happen to be a business owner or you are starting a business and then sort of like effective giving, you know, embedding the giving in your business thing is something that you resonate with, then you can perhaps explore B1G1 uh, and uh, yeah, join our movement. So yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. That and that was that inspirational. Was, that was amazing <laughs> advice. That was our first. That was the first uh, it, down that path. So we appreciate it. You know, we need we need more people that think like you, Masami, and um, are, are as compassionate as you are. Um, I, I love you saying we are all one, uh, you know, because mm-hmm. not everybody thinks like that. But once you think like that, so much else changes in your life. Right. Um So we're thankful to have met you and we want you to please keep doing what you're doing. Uh, We look forward to getting this podcast out to our audience. I think this was a great talk. Yeah. Um, You want to give some contact info? I would love to. All right. Masami is the founder and owner of B1G1. That's buy one, give one. Their website is www.b1g1.com. You can email them hello at b1g1.com and check out their Instagram at buy one, give one. Love it. Thanks, Masami. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Thanks you so for much for being me. with it's us. Thanks for getting pleasure. up early. We know that yes. it's uh it's a different time zone right there. <laughs> and uh, it's before the crack of dawn where you are, but uh, we, we're really glad that you took the time out to be with us and, and reach out to us. Mm-hmm. Oh, Thank you so much. All right. You have a great one. <laughs> Bye. Thank you for tuning in to the Same Business, Different Day podcast. Special thanks to Star Fox Media for video production and James Russell on music production. Please like and subscribe to the Same Business, Different Day podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcasts. Same Business, Different Day.